invite us to bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Oh God, we thank you for, again, for a great day, for a day for us to gather together, to, to recharge our batteries, to come together, to look to you, to consider what you have to say to us. Heavenly Father, as we prepare to reflect on your word some more this morning, we invite your Holy Spirit to dwell among us, to encourage us, to challenge us, Lord, to bring us some good news and to send us out into the world, a broken, dark world, which so desperately needs to hear your good news. And so, God, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. You are indeed our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Well, if you've got your Bibles this morning, I'll invite you to go to John 14, John 14, beginning with verse 15. And this is part of what's known as the farewell discourse as Jesus is getting ready uh, to leave the world. And uh, so he's praying over his disciples. He's praying over his friends. He's praying for the church. He's praying for the world. And he's getting ready uh, to go away. And so if you've got your Bibles, John 14, beginning with uh, verse 15. Go ahead and just put your finger there. We'll get there in just a moment. I wanted to give you a few minutes uh, to just get to John 14, beginning with verse 15. Well, I know many of you have been coming uh, to Faith Lutheran Church over the past few weeks, and I hope uh, you've had an opportunity to grow a little bit in uh, your understanding of who God made you uniquely to be. We're going through this sermon series. Uh, Hello, my name is... And several weeks ago, we began this journey together, really acknowledging that our identity, our primary identity as followers of Jesus is that we are indeed, as Chris said, we are children of God. And when we know deep in our hearts, deep in our lives, that we are children of God, it allows us to relax. It just frees us up to go exploring all those other questions in our lives, those ancient questions that people have been asking for centuries. Who am I? Who did God create me to be? What is my purpose in this world? And if God has given me some gifts, some talents, some skills, some things to do, how can I serve effectively? How can I help to grow God's kingdom? How can I make a difference in this world? In the past few weeks, we've been just kind of chewing on those questions over and over, reflecting, who did God make me to be? And how is God calling me to go out and make a difference in the world? And so this weekend, as we conclude, this is the bookend part of the uh, sermon series. If we began with, hello, my name is child of God, this weekend, we're spending some time talking about what it means to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. How are we empowered by the Holy Spirit? And I think about in our own lives, we oftentimes, it's not that we deny that the Holy Spirit exists, but we're not sure that the Holy Spirit is for us. We're not always sure that the Holy Spirit, that God in the Spirit has come and works and moves in your life and in my life. Today, we're going to look at what that means and hopefully that we can just crack that window open a little bit more. Because oftentimes, I think the Holy Spirit's not moving in our lives because we're so busy doing stuff for ourselves. We're not allowing the Holy Spirit. We're not letting go and allowing the Holy Spirit to just fill our lives, fill our hearts. I don't know about you, but I'm a bit of a control freak. I like, yeah, yeah, I know John says no, yeah. (laughs) I like to do stuff myself. Any control freaks here or is it just me? Okay. Yeah, there's a few of us here, so I'm speaking your language, right? We like to be able to control things. We like to be able to do things ourselves because when we control things, it's within our own power. We think that we've got, we can get a handle on the outcome of all that is going on. So I, as some of you know, I like to plan. I'm a planner, and I'll spend a lot of time planning all sorts of different things. And I have to tell you, 26 years ago, I was deep in the midst of an incredible, extraordinary plan. I'd been dating this girl for a few years, and I figured it was time 
to pop the question. So for months, I developed this elaborate plan. We were both working in Washington, D.C. And I include uh, Cindy's roommate uh, from, high, uh, from college in on my plan. Her name is Becca. I said, Becca, I need you to bring a folding chair to the Marine Corps Marathon. I just signed up for that. And my plan was very devious because I was going to stand at the front of the Marine Corps Marathon in front of 20,000 people and propose to my girlfriend. And I thought, this is a great plan. And then I found out that her aunt and uncle were also in town. And so I made them part of my plan. And I got my hands on a, a megaphone, one of these bullhorns. <laughs> And Cindy's uncle was going to bring the bullhorn, and Cindy's aunt was going to bring the engagement ring. And oh, I had a plan. I had all the details planned out on that morning in front of 20,000 people. I figured I just had better odds if I uh, made that ask in front of a lot of people. It would be very difficult for her to say no in that moment. So we all arrived right down there by the mall on that morning of the Marine Corps Marathon. And, and I was ready to run, and there was the chair, and there was the megaphone, and there was the engagement ring, and Cindy had no idea what was going on. And so as we gathered near the starting line, I said to everybody there, hey, I'm just going to go to the porta potty real quickly before we get ready to go here for the marathon. I'll be right back. Don't move. And so when I got to the porta potties that morning, there was a line. It was a pretty long line, I'm not gonna lie. And so I waited and waited and waited to get into the porta potty. And I wasn't really paying attention to the time. But I remember locking myself in the porta potty and I heard the gun go off for the start <laughs> of the race. Now I did what I needed to do. And I bounded out of that porta potty and I raced back to the starting line. But at that point in time, it was chaos everywhere. Most of those 20,000 people had begun to uh, start running the marathon that morning. And I'm not even sure if I saw Cindy's roommate, her aunt and uncle on that uh, at the starting line ever again. I, I think I ran into him at mile 19 or something. And Cindy's roommate, Becca, said, hey, do you want the chair? <laughs> I was tired. And I was pretty defeated. And my plan didn't quite work out. You ever make plans in your life? You spend lots and lots of time going over the details, all those things, and, and you've just laid out everything, and you think you've got the perfect plan. And then life happens, and things don't quite work out the way you think they're going to work out. I think that's true for all of us. I think being a control freak is an illusion that we really are under control. And I think oftentimes this is how we treat the Holy Spirit in our lives as well. Oh, the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Yep, I believe in the Holy Spirit. I just don't always include the Holy Spirit in my plans. I don't allow space for the Holy Spirit because I'm too busy doing my thing. And so this morning, as we talk about the Holy Spirit, I want to invite us to think again, our plans God's plans and how as Chris shared with us this morning those can be two pretty different things can't they and so let's look for the Holy Spirit this morning Jesus teaches us that even though we're not sure about the Holy Spirit in our lives that he is sure so he looks at his disciples and he says if you love me keep my commandments and I will ask the father and he will give you another advocate to help you and to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The Holy Spirit, Jesus says, helps. He comes to you to help you, to guide you, to advocate for you, and to walk with you as you go through life. The Holy Spirit gives us clarity 
an encouragement. And as I think about this sermon series and talking about our gifts and our passions and our talents and who God made us to be uniquely, our identity as children of God and all those other ways that God has gifted us to serve in this world. How many of you know what your spiritual gifts are? Just raise your hand if you know what your spiritual gifts are. Okay, some of you. If you know what your spiritual gift is, give me a spiritual gift if you've got one. Hospitality, Hospitality, of course. Hospitality, Hospitality, yes. You notice the first two hospitalities because they're all about making everybody else feel comfortable, right? So they break the ice. What are some other spiritual gifts that you've got? Come on. Caregiving. Good. Compassion. Compassion. Good. What else? Empathy. 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 Very good. What else? Music. Music. Sympathy. Sympathy. Yeah. Okay. What else? This is the interactive part of the sermon. Come on. (laughs) Our hospitality people broke the ice for us. What are some of your spiritual gifts? Faith. Faith. Say it again. Mission. Mission. Yeah, we all have these gifts, these things, and you didn't arrive at those things on your own. God has given those to you as a gift. And the Holy Spirit has helped to clarify those things in your life, your gifts. Many of us have experienced the Holy Spirit in this way. And as Chris shared this morning, the Holy Spirit gives us that clarity of how to move forward, how to use our gifts, how to step out in faith. Jesus says that's not all the Holy Spirit does to advocate, to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But if you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you will also live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show them to myself. Then Judas, Iscari- then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. Now, if you're here last weekend, you heard John share a little bit about, hey, guys, don't get angry with me. I'm the messenger. Remember last weekend we looked at the parable of the talents? And those were some pretty tough words. And I thought John did a great job just unpacking those things. And so oftentimes we hear these words of Jesus, and they make us uncomfortable. And Jesus reminds us, hey, I'm just the messenger. He says, these are not my words. These words come directly from the Father. Jesus says, I'm just the vessel. I'm the one who has emptied myself and walked on this earth so that the very presence of God could live among me and speak to you. I'm just the messenger. I'm the messenger of God. And that's really the work of the Holy Spirit, right? is to live and dwell in empty vessels. And oftentimes it's difficult for us to be empty vessels because it means we need to be empty. We need to be empty of ourselves, right? Because the gospel is really this, that Jesus emptied himself. He let go of himself. And he went to a cross. He said, God, not my will, but your will be done. And he said those words so that the Holy Spirit could move through him. And I think this is our same struggle. That we don't want to be empty. We want to be in control. We want to be in charge. 
Jesus says, these words you hear are not mine. They belong to the Father who sent me. So people of faith, how are you emptying your life? How are you being a vessel? Because if you're not emptying your life, if you're not relinquishing control, there's not room for the Holy Spirit in your life. I got to tell you, I learned this the hard way. Sometimes I got to learn things the hard way. Many years ago when I was uh, planning and, and preparing to become a pastor, I was sitting down with my mentor pastor, Paul, Paul Gaucher, and we would meet every Tuesday morning at Caribou Coffee in Burnsville, Minnesota. And as we sat over coffee, we would talk about all things life and ministry. And then I had a moment and a few opportunities to begin preaching. And Pastor Paul was so compassionate. He was so empathetic. He was so gracious to me. He said such kind words to me. He said, Brian, you do a really nice job preaching. But there's a few things I want to speak into your life about. <laughs> See, what Pastor Paul spoke into my life about is what I already knew about myself. Is that when I would go into the pulpit to preach a sermon, I would go into the pulpit with my Bible and my manuscript. And for the next 10, 15, 20 minutes, I would go through my manuscript and I would read to the congregation my sermon because I like to pl remember I like to plan I like to prepare <laughs> and I spend hours planning and preparing to preach on Sunday morning and I'm a bit of a wordsmith I really like words words are really important to me and I can craft a beautiful sentence on paper and I can fall so in love with that sentence on paper that I'm like oh that's exactly what I want to say that is just really going to impact the congregation today. And so I develop and I continue. I, here's my manuscript for this morning. And Pastor Paul said, Brian, that's an awesome sermon. Your content is great. But your delivery kind of stinks. <laughs> he said, when you're preaching, you are spending so much time with your words. You haven't emptied yourself and allowed these to be God's words. Ever gotten poked in the eye before? <laughs> but it was so hard to let go of my manuscript. So I continued to go into the pulpit with my Bible and my manuscript, and, and I would highlight some stuff, and you know, I would still you know, have all my paper, and, and I would continue to preach my words. Well, it was a Saturday night, the middle of January. If you've ever been in a nighttime in January in Minnesota, it's cold and dark. And there I was back in the pulpit, and this was a pretty large congregation. It seated about 1,400. There were about 600 people there that night. And, and I, there I was, Bible manuscript. As I got ready to preach, I read the gospel. And then I started into my manuscript to preach. 30 seconds in, the lights flickered. The sound went out. And then it went dark. And I couldn't see anyone. I couldn't see my manuscript. And I heard a voice off to my left. Our worship leader say, preach it, Brian. <laughs> In a moment like that, you really have no other choice, right? <laughs> and so I did. And I have no idea if I was anywhere close to my manuscript that night. <laughs> but I got to tell you, what the Holy Spirit did through my life and the words the Holy Spirit used were far more powerful than my words. That's just me. I learned the hard way. I got to wait until God turns off the lights. And ever since, as I've been preaching, 
on the weekends, I still create a manuscript. I'm not sure if what I'm saying this morning is really close to the manuscript or not. But here's what I know. The most difficult 10 seconds of my entire week are the 10 seconds just before I stand up to preach on Sunday morning. Because I've got that manuscript and I love my words. And I love all the hours that I've spent all week long digging in God's word. And I've got stuff to say. But in those 10 seconds, I got to decide, am I going to put my manuscript down and just allow the Holy Spirit to speak? And every week, I am in the midst of that battle, hanging on to my manuscript. I literally, on Sunday mornings, before I come to you, I open my hands and say, Lord, I have prepared all week long some really good stuff. I got stuff to say to these people. But in this moment, not my will, not my words. I'm giving it to you. And I just put my hands out and say, God, this is your sermon. This is your message because these are your people. So how are you emptying yourself and allowing the Holy Spirit to move in your life? How are you opening your hands and saying, God, not my will, but your will be done? Jesus says, these words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. Guys, I'm just an empty vessel. It's the Holy Spirit that moves through me. And so those are the same things that we need to ask ourselves. How are we empty vessels so that the Holy Spirit can move through us? Jesus finishes up here. All this I have spoken while I've been still with you. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Jesus tells us exactly why I think oftentimes we don't allow the Holy Spirit to live in our lives. It's because we're fearful. We're not sure that the Holy Spirit's going to show up in our lives. We're pretty sure that the Holy Spirit showed up in Chris's life or in John's life, or somebody else's life, but is the Holy Spirit really going to show up in my life? And that, I think, is the question for us every single day. But Jesus says, hey, in the midst of your fear, I offer you peace. That's what the Holy Spirit does, is the Holy Spirit gives us peace, even in the midst of our fear. I can't help but wonder if many of us are not experiencing the peace of the Lord, the peace of the Holy Spirit more fully in our lives is because we are so darn busy running around with all the noise, all the gadgets, all the electronics, all those things that distract us. It's really interesting. Yesterday I was uh, out watching uh, the ISU homecoming parade. Anybody go to the homecoming parade yesterday? Maybe just me. Awesome. So one of my observations uh, of the people who were at the homecoming parade uh, yesterday was all the people just um, kind of standing out on the street looking at their phones. I thought, wow, look at, look at the crowd of people. And hardly anybody's even talking to each other. They're just so busy looking down. And then the parade began. And as I watched people on the floats going by, you know what the people on the floats were doing? They were looking at their phones too. <laughs> or they were recording the audio, you know, the, everybody who was there at the parade route. And then pretty soon there comes, you know, other people who are marching along in the parade. You know what they're doing? They're marching in the parade looking at their phone. <laughs> We have become a nation of phone dwellers, looking down obsessed with our technology. You know, I recently heard this week, uh, in fact, oh boy, now I'm all tied up in my phone. (laughs) See, that's what happens, you get tied up. That people are now dialing 911 and saying, I can't get into Facebook. That is a true story. There are some communities where the 911 operators are getting so tied up because so many people are calling in in a panic. Help me get into my Facebook. Don't do that. That's not an emergency. 
But that is a real story. I came across a, a study this past week put out by Baylor University and the influence of technology in our lives, and it's influencing our lives in a profound way. It's influencing our relationships. And in this study, they said that more than half the people as a part of this uh, study, their marital relationship was, was suffering because of the technology. Yeah. It's impacting our lives, our relationships. And there's this new term called fubbed. Anybody been fubbed? Fubbed is being snubbed by a phone. And the idea is when you're trying to have a conversation with someone, they're not paying attention to you. They're on their technology. Anybody been fubbed? Yeah, see, I'm not making this stuff up. Anybody a fubber? <laughs> this week, if someone's not paying attention to you, say, hey, you're fubbing me. You're snubbing me for your technology. Knock it off. And I can't help but think that we're fubbing the Holy Spirit. We're so busy. We're so obsessed with our technology that we're not spending time listening. And Jesus says, I will give you peace, but you got to listen to me. So where do you find that peace? I want to encourage you. I think you've got to be more creative than ever before to carve out time in your daily life, to put down the technology, to walk away from it and just sit down and find a quiet place where you can just spend some time in God's word, reading God's word, away from your technology, away from all the noise, away from all the distractions, the computers, the tablets. The music, all that stuff, just put it down and find a place to be quiet with God. My wife was talking to her sister uh, this past week, and uh, my sister-in-law has five kids. She's got a lot of noise running around the house. And she was sharing with my, sister, uh, with my wife, with Cindy, that every morning she goes down into the basement, into the bathroom, and locks the door and that's where she has her quiet time, is in the bathroom basement. That's what we got to do, folks. Some of us need to get away from all the noise because it's everywhere. It's all around us. And Jesus says when you empty yourself, when you empty your life and allow the Holy Spirit, just watch what I will do. Just watch what the Holy Spirit can do in our lives. See, I want to be a part of a church that says it's not about what we do. It's not about all the things that we can accomplish on our own power. We want to be a church that has relinquished ourselves, that have become empty vessels, that we are just longing to be in the presence of the Holy Spirit and allow the Holy Spirit to move through us. See, there are so many churches that do a lot of neat things. And the world looks at these churches and says, wow, that church is doing some kind of neat things. But that's not compelling, folks. There's a lot of folks who are doing a lot of neat, helpful, good things. But that's not the church. The church is a place where people come together to let go of themselves and to allow the Holy Spirit. See, a church that captivates the world is a church where people look at that church and they say, I have no idea what's going on in that church. But that's extraordinary. That is way beyond what any individuals or group of people can do. That's unexplainable. See, that's what's compelling to the world is those extraordinary things in our lives, in our church. And that's the amazing thing of the Holy Spirit. I know that's hard. I know that's hard because what that calls us to do is to let go of ourselves, to become empty vessels, to come before God and say, God, it's not my will, but your will be done. I'm making myself empty. I'm making myself a vessel. Fill me with your Holy Spirit so that together we can do extraordinary things. Let us pray. 
Oh God, this is such an incredibly difficult topic of the Holy Spirit because it flies smack in the face of all those things we want to be. We want to be in control. We want to do stuff. God, we want to be about me and what we can do. But Father, you have called us to empty ourselves like you emptied yourself on the cross. To just let go of all that drives us and allow your Holy Spirit to come and dwell in us. God, I thank you for the ways in which you have gifted each person in this room. The ways, Lord, in which you have called us and invited us to step out and to do extraordinary things. And so, Lord, give us the courage, the strength, and the obedience to step out and allow your Spirit to fill us. All these things we pray in Christ's name. Amen.